I invite them to another call where we can sit down and do the strategy session or discovery call. And at the end of that, I can ask them, here's what it looks like to work with me. Do you want to sign up? Here's how much it is. So I'm creating these strategy sessions through the podcast. And that's a great way to get out there. It's just to like interview your audience. Most hosts never achieve the results they hoped for. They're falling short on listenership and monetization, meaning their message isn't being heard and their show ends up costing them money. This podcast was created to help you grow your listenership and make money while you're at it. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Adam Adams. What's up, podcaster? It's your host, Adam Adams. And today I'm joined with James Allen from Profit Your Knowledge. You can check out his website and the link to his podcast just by scrolling down. And his bio is in the show notes as well. So if you want to check out his bio and or connect with him, any social media that he wanted you to have is already down in the show notes. So welcome, James. It's good to have you. We're going to be talking about podcasting and how to be a better podcaster. And let's get a little bit of your podcast journey. I'm going to start by just asking you, why did you start a podcast? What was behind the decision to making? Yeah. Grateful to be here, first of all, Adam. And uh, starting my podcast, I left construction work. It was about five years ago or so. And I just got into coaching and I was like, I'm going to start a podcast because that's what you're supposed to do. Like, As a coach, you should have a podcast. Like Everybody does it. So I started podcasting and I was just doing solo episodes for a long time. And then I branched out, tried to do interview episodes. And I was trying to make money with my podcast, obviously, but I don't know why. I just kept doing it, even though I was kind of pursuing other things. So I wasn't getting a huge ROI from my podcast, even doing guest interviews and stuff. But I just kept uploading. There's a point where I wasn't even making like actual podcast episodes. I was making YouTube videos, but I was uploading them to my podcast. And I tried like a ton of different formats. And then um, I started doing interviews again and ended up realizing that that was kind of what one, I really liked to do was the interview style. And two, I was able to connect with my audience. And then that's how I kind of started like making actual money from the podcast. But yeah, getting started, I just kind of figured like, this is what you should do as a coach. So I've been doing it from day one. So it's probably like the one channel out of every social media channel platform that I have where you can see like my entire journey is on the that podcast, cool. which is kind of cool. That is really cool. And maybe for you to look back on in 20 years from now, it might be kind of fun, like a journal or your kids or something like that, your family members kind of checking that out. So that's really neat. So I'm hearing you say in the beginning, there was not a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. You tried a lot of formats. Then you went to YouTube interviews, and that's when you started making money from the podcast. So to be clear, share with the listener, in your opinion, is the audio experience giving you more traction or is the video experience giving you more traction? Yeah. So I was making just regular YouTube videos and I would just upload the YouTube audio to the podcast, but it sounded kind of clunky because podcasts, you know, should be more, I guess I like it more where it's more raw and authentic and not so edited. So it's kind of choppy with like the YouTube, it's more fast action stuff. I started doing like more of the podcasting, actually keeping it very natural. And then I would even record my video and edit that, turn that into YouTube videos. But with my interviews and everything that I started doing, I realized that my YouTube videos would perform better when they were just me and my solo things, unless I interviewed someone who happened to have a lot of you know, influence or something behind them where people would search for them, some SEO keywords and whatnot, then um, I would put that onto YouTube. But I was interviewing guests and different people in just the creative niche and like, how did you start your business? And I interviewed people who are making millions of dollars and this is still what I do from people who are just getting started earning their first dollars. And I think that's cool as a podcast, like shorter episodes, about 30 minutes on average. And I was uploading the full video file onto YouTube and I had to make the thumbnail and like production wise, it was just a lot and like the tags and there was a lot more steps to the YouTube stuff. So it's kind of just an executive decision that I made of I'm just going to put these things on the audio. So it's my podcast is only audio and I keep okay. my YouTube like a separate thing because I'm trying to like get these experts message out there. So on YouTube, they would get like one or two views where my normal videos were getting like hundreds, you know, or yeah. 60 plus or even thousands of views were just like my normal stuff. So I'm like, just like juice versus is the juice worth the squeeze? Not really to put these interviews on there unless you like really focus on 
editing them and making them be very professional. Like if you watch Tom Bilyeu or one of those or Joe Rogan or something, one of them is like, it's very engaging in like the shots and the changes and stuff rather than like a Zoom recording. Yeah. But also they have celebrities and experts and like these really huge people, which naturally you just want to get into their head and into their mm. world more because they have so much influence. But me, I'm interviewing a lot of smaller people. So I noticed on the podcast that the episodes are performing significantly better than the YouTube channel. And that's why I made that executive decision to just keep the podcast with these interviews, just a podcast. So here's what I'm hearing. And I think the listener is too. James, you started by doing everything and then you kind of switched it to, I do this type of thing on this platform and this other type of thing on this platform. So far, am I right? Okay. With that in mind, I'm wondering if you had to make a choice and be honest, not just because we're on a podcasting show right now. If you had to make a choice, a business decision to either completely stop the YouTube videos that are solos and go only on interview episodes that are audio experience or completely stop interviews that are audio experience and go completely I don't know if I'm saying it backwards. I'm, no, I know I'm what like, you're saying. Just which one would you YouTube. ditch if you were like, somebody said you got to ditch one? Yeah, it's tricky. I feel like in the long run, I would ditch the podcast and I would focus on the YouTube aspect. But the thing about my podcast is that, I mean, it's difficult because I learned this thing from an old mentor of mine about hunting versus gardening. And when you garden something, you're building your garden. It takes time. It takes effort to set up the garden to nurture your plants and everything. And then eventually over time with work, you can bear fruit and have tons of food and whatnot for as long as you want. Basically, you just keep tending to your garden. Hunting is a lot more aggressive. It takes more effort up front, but you can catch food a bit faster instead of waiting for your garden to harvest. So I think about yeah. business in that way, where even like building your audience, an example with a podcast, that's gardening. It takes time. Like you don't build an audience fast, at least like a really good loyal audience. And that's YouTube for me because I get the majority of my opt-ins that go into my system where I sell like courses and can book phone calls and that sort of stuff. YouTube, I think is just my personal experience because I've seen so much more of an ROI on that. It's been great. But recently the podcast is kind of tricky because... I interview experts and the show is for people who want to get into the expert industry or grow in the expert industry, but I also like work with experts. So I use my podcast as a leveraged tool to create content, to be out there and to give someone else a platform and make something cool that they can share with their audience. They can turn into clips or whatever they want. And it drives traffic over to me, which is nice. But also I get to create cool conversations where I can go in front of other people's audience to get on their podcast. And that does bring clients in too. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, to answer your question though, you know, it's like, which one would I totally ditch? It's hard because they both work in my business in different yeah. ways. The podcast is great for like getting quicker money. But the thing is too, that I have to service a lot more where the YouTube side, it generates more of that kind of passive income for me. How so does it do the passive on the YouTube for you? Yeah. I mean, it can work on a podcast too. It kind of depends because I feel like just for me personally, like podcasting hasn't been like massive with my audience. It's definitely grown since I've been doing the interviews because my downloads and shows are just significantly growing and more episodes like that I put out, more people come back and listen to episodes because they're fun and they're good episodes. So it is growing. But bottom line is when you make a piece of content and it's valuable inside of your content, you just offer a lead magnet which is something free in exchange for someone's email address. And a great way to think about it is just what's something like a persistent problem that your audience faces and how can you solve that quickly? So if it's like a great example is the double your dating example. And Russell Brunson talks about this a lot, but uh, it's about the kiss test. So you give them your email address and then it goes to a page and it tells you what the kiss test is. It's not about how to like get women in the whole entire system. Like your course could be, you know, um, but the kiss test is basically like you lean in or you touch their hair or something. And then if they lean in towards you, then they're more open to like kissing and then you can go for the move. But if they back up, then, you know, you're like, okay, they don't want to kiss. And that's kind of like what can kickstart your relationship. So it's just like a quick win for someone. And that's what you think about lead magnets. But every time someone opts in and picks up your lead magnet, then it should trigger a series of like your funnel, basically a series of emails or it goes to another page 
they can invite them, show them a video, a case study or something and invite them to book a call with you. Or if you want it to be real passive, you can create digital products like online courses or sell an ebook or something. So that's where YouTube works for me. Because if you watch my YouTube channel on profit your knowledge doc or profit your knowledge on YouTube, you'll see that in the video at some point, I always offer my lead magnet. And it's just like a quick little pitch. It's like, by the way, if you like related to one of my points that I'm teaching, if I, I did one example, where I was talking about eight small changes you can use to work less and earn more money. And I was giving a couple of different examples about some productivity tips, because that's what I used to teach. And then I also talked about like build digital products. And by the way, if you're trying to figure out how to build digital products, I made a whole guide that walks you through the process and how to do it. You know, so that's a lead magnet and then people can pick that up. So I'm getting opt-ins every single day, mostly through my YouTube channel rather than the podcast. You see what I mean? Yeah. And then that yeah. starts the funnel and that's how it turns into passive income. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. And the passive income is because you don't have to work for that person. It's just that the money that you're making is automated. Is that yeah. sounding right? Yeah. And so it's just like, a, it's like a course. Yeah. You that sell they're digital products that pretty much cool. can do your coaching for you to an extent. I mean, you know, I, I love coaching. I love working with people because I help them build those kind of systems. Um, and it's great. And I love people being like, this is so cool and seeing their wins and everything. But at the same time, like that's laborious to work with people and to service people as well. And I just have always been fascinated by that aspect of creating digital products that are still valuable and transformative for people. And I've learned ways that you can actually build that and make it actually be legit and transformative. And then at the same time, giving you more freedom. Cause like, I just like looked at my PayPal account and I had like 1500 bucks coming over to me today. And I was just like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Like it's rad. And yeah, it's because I have systems and I use digital products that are valuable for people. And then they purchase those things. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, it's really difficult to choose one, but I think if I had to choose one, I would go probably on the YouTube side because I can still do interviews on my YouTube channel and that kind of stuff. But ideally, I'd rather keep both because they both work in different ways. <laughs> yeah. So can you uh, outline the strategy and the benefit that you get off of podcasting? So for example, like you're serving a listener, or you're serving a guest, they're hiring you, you're networking with guests, they're putting you in touch with other people, you're selling your own services, mm -hmm. you're offering your lead magnets or whatever. What is kind of like um, I don't know the best way to ask the question, but like, what is your approach, your strategy to your podcast to make it successful? Yeah. So I actually made a video about this on my channel, my YouTube channel, but it was about how I earned $4,000 in my first week of podcasting. It wasn't truly, that was just like an enticing, you know, title. Cause I tell them in the beginning, I, I've actually been podcasting for years to do this for like podcasting. And I've tried a ton of different things. It hasn't been working. And I met this guy named Josh Tapp who has a podcast called The Lucky Titan. And I've known this with some people that do this strategy, but it's a totally like legitimate thing. And I feel like so many people don't use it enough. But uh, I tried like cold DMs, you know, I tried Facebook ads. I do get some people to uh, book calls through my YouTube channel as well. Um, but it was like, it was kind of inconsistent with it as I'm growing my channel and I have a YouTube coach and that sort of stuff. But um, I pretty much was just like, had this epiphany talking with this guy, Josh, cause you know, we're talking about podcasting and stuff and he's like, and just business in general. And he was like, have you thought about interviewing your target audience? And I was like, I didn't really think about that. You know, like using my podcast to create conversations that build rapport. Because if I message someone on social media, and even if I'm being cool, being like, hey, what's going on? There's always that game of like, who's going to pitch first? And that's just what I've experienced over years of doing this. It's like some random dude who I can look at your profile and see you do business stuff. And like you're a marketing guy or whatever. And you're trying to like, what are you trying to get at? Even if I'm just being cool, just like starting a relationship, because I literally tried that. Just being like, I'm just going to get to know you. You know, I'm just like nothing here. But people are just so burned by that because it's become so prevalent. So yeah. now I can reach out to people. And I can see someone I like, look at their profile, and I have a bit of a criteria here. Obviously, I, I have like I want my show to be something that is legit where people can discover it and be like, this is a really cool show. That's why I like to interview people from getting started, earning their first few sales to earning millions, you know, because you can learn something from all these different people and different points in their business. I like interviewing people in different niches, which is great for me too, because I work with people in different niches as long as they're creative like that. 
so it's really full circle, but it's always about the audience first. And then there's two other boxes. Number one is when I'm looking at someone to see if they're a good guest, would they potentially be like a good client? It's kind of like online dating. You know, if you're scrolling and stuff and you see someone, you look at their profile and you're like, oh, like I could go on a date with this person. I'd like to get to know them more. I could see something potentially working out here, but you don't really know until you go on a date. So then you try and go on a date. It's kind of the same thing. But the other thing I'm looking for, sometimes I can see people and I can see like they already, they don't really need my help really, but they have, they probably have built up my audience already, or they have a bigger podcast where I can connect with them, build a relationship and we can collaborate in some way. And it's that law of reciprocity of like, you were on my show. Now I can come onto your show. Literally like you and me right now, <laughs> yeah. basically. Yeah. 100%. This is what happened. Yeah. So I like that. Those are the two things I think about on top of like, is it going to be valuable for my audience? And sometimes people check all three boxes, but if someone can check off, like, is it going to be valuable for my audience, the message and the person I'm bringing on, can I relate it to what my show is about? That's always got to be checked. And then at least one of the other two, are they a potential client or do they have an audience that I can get in front of? That's how I know it's a good client. And then I invite them onto my show. And instead of me DMing people, now we can have a cool conversation. I keep my episodes short for two reasons. One, I think it's nice to listen to that as a podcast like listener because the mm -hmm. typical commute is like 20 something minutes. So I have to keep them around 20 to 30 minute long episodes. It's roughly someone's commute. And then on top of that, it's short where it's long enough where I can build rapport with someone, but short enough where it's not going to take all day for me. So I can, I can knock out a crap ton of interviews, which means more conversations with people, which means more opportunity to build a relationship with the actual decision makers instead of, you know, trying to battle with a bot on Facebook or someone else's assistant. I can actually get the real person on the show, get to know them, ask about their business and stuff. And um, yeah, that's kind of how I leverage the podcast. I love it. I'm taking lots of notes, brother. I'm taking tons and tons and tons of notes. You wouldn't even believe. And I'm hoping that the listener got some of what you just mentioned. It, when it comes to like the benefits of having your episodes a bit shorter, granted, I just interviewed somebody yesterday or the day before. I think it was two days ago. And his episodes are between three hours long to six hours long. And when he has a three hour long episode, he gets a whole bunch of his people coming and calling him and saying, why is it so short? I don't want it that short. Because they, <laughs> the, they want the four, five, and six. The What's three was just not enough. It's called Land of the Creeps. Land of the Creeps. Um, is it like a so, storytelling podcast or something? For the most part, yes. It's TV and film. And so they go and break down like the vit movies and they go, they like study, how do they do the makeup? How do they do the blood? They study random things like who is this in the cast and which, how many movies has that person been in and what did they use for the sound effects? And then they have tons of their listeners who call in and leave like voicemails and they'll play all of those voicemails for the listener. He was like, that takes like almost an hour of the time. It's just all of our listeners, these little voicemails. And I'm listening to this guy because, you know, Joe Rogan, his podcasts are like one to three hours. Right. And I guess Land of the Creeps is successful, very successful. In fact, they have a very loyal following and it is very niched. But like the shortest they'll go is three hours. They'll start at seven and they'll, you know, they'll end at 10 p.m. or they'll end at midnight. Wow. And, and, and they'll record like at nights with four people. And so I think it's really interesting, like, but there are some huge benefits with the shorter episodes and you named a few. Mm -hmm. One of them that I heard you say is you have a chance to start courting or dating um, your, your perfect client, start to have a relationship with them. It's long enough that you can have that relationship, but it's not so long that like it's taking all of this extra time. So you keep a few of them short. It also can be beneficial because we know that someone can finish it on a commute. Not that everybody's doing them on a commute. Sometimes I listen to podcasts when I'm going from Denver to Moab, which I'm doing this weekend. I'm leaving for Moab to do some jeeping and I will at least listen to books on tape and I'll listen to lots of podcasts. So that commute's a bit longer, but I still love yesterday. I know I don't mean to say too much because this is your interview. I want you to shine. I don't mean to say too much. I had a group of four women come to do a discovery call with me and they are sharp. These ladies, like a couple of them are doctors and all of this stuff. Like mm. 
they're just sharp, sharp people. And they knew really good questions to ask. So we had a discovery call that went way longer than normal, especially because there was four of them and they were all curious. One of the questions they had is how long should the episode be? My answer to them yesterday was it really does not matter. There is no evidence to show any length of time. I've seen five minutes be successful, 10, 20, 25 to 30, a typical commute being successful, a one hour being successful, Joe Rogan at two hours, and even Land of the Creeps at six hours, all being successful. So it's just, it's interesting, but I love the benefits, especially for our listener today, who probably has a business and they can get those additional benefits by having more conversations with people. And this brings me to a question because it sounds like you said, I can have more conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious how many episodes you're publishing in a week. Is it just one a week or are you trying for three or four a week? It kind of depends on the frequency at which like my calendar is scheduled out. I don't know. I don't like leaving people hanging and being like, your episode's going to be live in six <laughs> months. And they're like, okay. I like to just be like, hey, like a couple weeks, it's going to be out. So I do like three on average, I okay. would say. But sometimes I'll, I'll ramp it up and sometimes it's like Monday through Friday. There's episodes yeah. going out. Yeah, because... I don't know. I'm just kind of weird because I like to use my podcast as more of a networking tool, okay. which is really amazing instead of growing a huge audience on the podcast, even though my audience is growing. But no one's ever complained to me if I post daily for a couple of weeks and then I post like two days for a couple of weeks. Like nobody has ever messaged me and be like, why aren't you consistent or whatever? It's like I'm posting every single week and it's awesome yeah. content and it's great conversations. Like just the way I've set up the interviews and the questions that I'm able to ask and stuff like that. And People always say that I'm a really good interviewer and stuff. And I'm like, awesome. I'm happy you guys enjoy it. That's really great. I've just you know, been able to find a little flow for me and make everything very congruent to where I'm a creator helping creators by talking with other creators. You yeah. Know? So it's very And I'm a circle. podcaster helping podcasters. I love what you're saying. Man, I had a great question just on the tip of my mind. And as I was listening to you, I forgot it right at the end. So it goes with the amount of episodes that you're doing. You mentioned that sometimes you'll do two, sometimes you'll do five. It averages three. And I had a random question and, and I'm hoping you say a certain thing. I want you to say a certain thing, but I'm not going to lead you. Is there a minimum per week that you are going to do? Is it that you could go every other week for a little while or do you have to do one? Do you have to do two in a week? Is there a minimum? I'm going to call it sporadic. It's not no offense. I don't know what else word to use, but let's no, just yeah, say it sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Yeah. What's the minimum you would ever be willing to do? Bare minimum is once a week. Like bare, Boom. bare minimum. Hey, yeah. thank you for getting my cue. I wanted you to say I yeah. wanted you to say one. I no, should have okay. typed it in the chat. Please yeah, say one. Consistency, you know, is really important and relevancy and all that. And I've always adopted that learning from my mentors, getting into creativity and like YouTube videos, like at least put one thing up per week on these yeah. platforms, bare yeah. minimum. So on the podcast, yeah, I sometimes I'll not have, or sometimes I'll misjudge the amount of interviews. Like I went to Sweden for two weeks and I, I, t I think I told you about this, but I made the decision that- Yeah, I'm on your podcast. Do, yeah, I'm not gonna do any work on this trip, like nothing. And I was doing a bunch of episodes, you know, enrolling some people and I informed them, like I'm actually gonna be gone for a little bit, but we could pick it up when we get back and that sort of stuff. But they can message me if they have questions and things. You know, I, I use Voxer for my clients, but I'm not doing any like sit down actual calls. I was gonna be in the country too. I didn't even know if I'd have like service or anything. Yeah, I told you about this, how when I got back, I made eight grand on the whole trip, which was super cool. But yeah. um, with the podcast, I was doing like three or four days per week. And I had all these interviews and I'm like, cool. So I should be able to keep this schedule like going. But I was also working on this other project that in return helped me make you know more passive income, which was like my Kajabi affiliate side. And it was just like a lot going on for the trip, but then I wasn't going to do anything on the trip. And then I realized that I like misjudged my scheduling routine because I was trying to have like two per week, two or three, like consistently while I was gone, and then pick it up when I got back. I ran out, I took up all the spaces early on. And I misjudged the amount of time. So I was like, oh crap, like the couple of weeks where I'm gone, I have to just do like one per week, just bare yeah. minimum. So yeah, there's times where that, that will happen to me. But so I, I want to ask you some details on your business, how your clients or AKA, how would a podcaster today, one of the ways, how would they make money? 
And I want to start by prepping the question, prefacing the question here. Number one, the top way that people monetize a podcast, or when I say top, I don't mean the most amount of money. I mean the most amount of people do it that way. And it's called CPM, where it's cost per meal and you get peanuts. Like if you have a thousand listeners, you might make 30 bucks in an episode or something like that. This is nothing. It's like, it's frustrating. Next one up is you work with a sponsor of the show, a partner of the show that they fit with your same, they align with your same listener, your same perfect client. They can serve them and not take away from you. And so you can reach, you reach out to them, CPM, they reach to you. The second way you reach to them and you can command a much higher amount. So let's just say you have a thousand listeners, then you might be making closer to, let's just say $500 an episode, something like that. So instead of uh, 30 bucks, it's like 500 bucks. And now the third way, the third way is the way that I really want you to take away and kind of give some of your secret sauce, maybe even some of the stuff that's in your courses that help people to do this. And it's when you sell your own product or service. So for me on my podcast, the only way that I monetize, well, there is some affiliate stuff, which I guess is option number four we won't talk about, but it's peanuts as well. But the main way that we monetize is by selling our own services. We serve podcasters and it's a monthly fee and there's a usually a 12-month commitment to working with us. So it ends up that we get enough clients that are listeners of the show that we do really, really well in the mid five figures every month. And I know that you do stuff like that, like where you were out of town for a couple of weeks, you made eight grand. You made eight grand while you were gone. I think it was four or eight grand the first week that you launched a podcast, things like that. So talking about courses and how they work, how could our listener today, who is a podcaster, make sure that they're monetizing their show using something that you could help them with? Right. Yeah, so courses are definitely an option. I think it's a good idea to coach people first if you're like really green with this. You know, always be building your audience, but I think it's good to work with some people till you find a system that you can use and then you can replicate that into a course. Because when I'm coaching you, you can ask me questions, I can change things up, I can change the entire system to be like, here, okay, here's a better way to make this work for you. You know, and then a course, you're pretty much making a carbon copy of that system where people can follow it, but you want to make sure that it works and that it's transformative for people. So I think using your podcast personally and structuring it, it kind of depends on your audience though, because like you and me, it goes back to that trifecta of I'm a creator helping creators by interviewing creators. You're a podcaster helping podcasters by interviewing other podcasters. And it goes full circle. And there's this Period, if you can structure your show in that way, it takes some creativity, I'm not gonna lie. And I'm still trying to figure out how to make this really work because it's really pretty new thing where I started doing these interviews like this, like fairly new the way I've been approaching it. But I think about your podcast episode, in the beginning, you know, you kind of build rapport, get to know the person, and then you do the episode and you're asking questions and you're, again, building rapport. You're building that know, like, and trust factor and you can kind of sprinkle in like the way that you help people and talk about your story and the way you do things. And naturally, when you stop the recording, there's going to be that afterwards period after you're done recording. And that's kind of something I just call like the golden window, basically. And it's your opportunity to tell them, here's when your episode is going to be launched here. You know, and you just give them like logistics or whatever. And then I always like to open up a question of, okay, well, like, how can I support you? What are you working on right now? And it's just like a really open-ended, like simple question. They'll be like, oh, I'm actually like, I'm trying to build a course. Or if I talked about it earlier, they'll refer that and be like, I was actually trying to do that. And like, but my system is total crap because it's not making any sales. And I'll be like, oh, okay, well, do you want some help with that? And they're like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, cool. So we open up their thing and kind of check through. And then from there, I invite them to another call where we can sit down and do the quote unquote strategy session or discovery call where I go deeper into it, ask them even more questions. And at the end of that, I can ask them, here's what it looks like to work with me. Like, do you want to sign up? Here's how much it is. So I'm creating these strategy sessions through the podcast. And that's a great way, I think, to get out there. It's just to like interview your audience. But again, it takes creativity to kind of find like that trifecta, like both you and I have, Adam, for someone else. So yeah. that's one way. But when you start getting an audience on my podcast, when you were on, you were talking about, we were both talking about how it's like choosing between interview style or doing solo episodes. And you were kind of saying like, if you're doing interviews, like you should do some solo episodes. 
So as you're doing these interviews, you can be creating these conversations with people where you can invite people to a strategy session and then sprinkle in some solo episodes where you offer your lead magnet. And at least if you're just getting started and you don't even have a program yet and you're still kind of finding your system with your private clients that you're getting, on these solo episodes, you can say, if it's podcasting, like, hey, we made a whole podcasting gear guide. It's my gift to you. There's a link in the description. Make sure you pick it up. People click on it. They put in their email address. Now they're on your email list. And you can be building up that email list. When your email list is like at least 300 people, then it's a good time to start thinking about like, oh, I could build a program. But you could be getting traffic from the people and building your podcast where it's getting more regular listeners by doing these interviews that are also creating conversations for you. And then as the show grows, then you can do these solo episodes and invite people to get on your email list. So people are running through and they're like, ooh, cool, a solo episode. And again, like you said, they could be short. They could be like five, 10 minutes, but you offer this lead magnet. And that's the important thing. And once that a podcast episode is created, much like my YouTube videos, it lives on forever. And people, as long as you're getting listeners, people will be able to listen to that while you're chilling in Sweden or while you're you know, driving over to Moab or whatever it is that you're trying to do. You have a good memory. Yeah. So that's kind of how I would think about this strategy in terms of podcasting. But what's cool is that the more times in you have episodes where you can offer that lead magnet on top of stacking value, because your lead magnet should be valuable. It's coming up with the gear guide or it's something that solves a persistent problem. Like I mentioned earlier, people are going to want to get onto your email list. They'll be happy to give you their email. And then from there, when you start building a program and you have more of an audience and an email list, you can send a survey or you can even use your podcast at the end of it to say, hey, I'm thinking about building a product around this topic. You mind if I ask you a couple questions? And then you ask these people and you can turn this into a survey thing as well. But you wanna find out from your audience, what's your biggest challenge or frustration you're dealing with? That's point A. Point B is what's the biggest hope, dream, or desire you have related to X, Y, Z. So it could be podcasting or whatever. And then what's the biggest barrier, challenge, or obstacle you feel is getting in the way? So we're kind of figuring out, and you can word these however you want, but the bottom line is you want to figure out from as many people in your audience as possible, where are you at, point A, where do you want to be, point B, and what's getting in the way? What's like that brick wall that's stopping you from making that happen? And when you find that, the more information you get and data you get from people on surveys and conversations and take notes, you're going to start to spot trends. And you'll be like, everybody seems to be struggling with this sort of transformation. They want to get from point A to point B here. If it's with podcasting, it's like, I want to grow my audience. That's like the big thing that people are struggling with. So you can build a course around that. And once you know that transformation, then you can create a really simple outline where you say, here's point A, here's point B, this is the transformation they want. And then list out five to seven steps. They get people from point A to point B. It's like, well, they have to do this. They have to do this, 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 and this. This is the must know information. They have to do this if they want to get that transformation. And those steps are going to become your course lessons, which really are just mini transformations that are stepping stones to the big transformation. So by the time they go off at each one, they build off of each other, then they got the big transformation. And that's how you can know, first off, that your audience is actually going to buy this thing and be interested in it. And number two, it's going to be transformative for them. And that's when you can have a really good product. A lot of good stuff. What I'm hearing is for the monetizing strategy for a podcast, if using some of the ways that you've done it and gained some passive income and things like that, some of the ways is there's coaching that you can monetize and then there's courses. The coaching is more one-on-one. It's more busy. It's more face-to-face. It's more effort, if you will. And then there's the courses where I guess it is still effort up in the front to create it, outline it, design it, record it, put it up. But then later it is residual, more passive at the end. And so there's two ways that we can do it. And you mentioned that you get a lot of your coaching clients as the guests of your show. And you gain more of the course clients through listeners and lead magnets. And you also mentioned like the a cool tip and a trick that another person can do if they've got a business like this, a survey and find out the hopes and the challenges. Like, where do you want to go? What's staying in the way? And then they can build a course to support the listeners. And you mentioned in podcasting, getting listeners is one of the big things. So for example, I could do a course on how do you get more listeners, put it out, have a little bit more of that residual income where it's it's upfront work and less later on. And yeah, maybe I should talk to you about that as well. You talked about when you're interviewing, I'm loving some of this content, by the way, when you're interviewing, you start by building rapport. 
I don't even know how to spell rapport. Uh, you start by building that though. And then you go into the interview and intentionally, if you're listening, write this down, intentionally sprinkling in some of what you do while doing that interview so that it's like planting a seed and nurturing and watering the seed. So at the end, when you get to what you mentioned, the afterwards period, the golden window, how can I support you? Would you like any help with that? And then moving into a strategy session or discovery call. A lot of very valuable things for the listener on understanding, how am I going to monetize my podcast? How am I going to get more coaching clients? How am I going to get more clients for my course? And then you, you said, but when you started getting an audience, so things are a little bit different. It's more of the interviews. It's more of the solos. It's more of the lead magnets. And it's up there forever. But I've got a question that I think that the listener probably wants to know. When you're done with an episode, how do you know that you have time? And here's the thing for me. I might, and I think a listener is with me here. Let's say we're batch recording. I'm batch recording today. So James, before I was with you, I had another call right before. And then I didn't really have any time. And then I have you. And then I don't really have any time. And then I have someone else. So the first concern becomes... What if there's not enough time and I feel rushed? I look like I'm rushed and it kind of scares that person away. How do you build in enough time so that you can have the golden window, the afterwards period with that person and asking those cool questions like, how can I help you? What are you struggling with? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the first concern is, is time, making sure that we build it in. And the second concern is, holy shit, like, I have to ask for a sale. I have to like, you know, what is my face going to look like? Am I going to look scared? Because I'm going to feel scared. I'm not sure if they're going to say yes. And I don't want to hear no, because that's, hearing no, that's going to like hurt my feelings. And and then how am I going to act? And, and I'm going to look stupid in front of them. So could you just address those two questions in the afterward period? Like, what are you doing to keep the time? And what are you doing to like not look like an idiot, if you will? Right. So I use Calendly in terms of the technical stuff for time. And inside of Calendly, when you set up an event, you can decide how long the event's going to be. So I make it 45 minutes because I like to keep episodes right around 30 minutes. And then you can also add a buffer of however long you want. It could be 10 minutes up to like two hours or three hours or something. So if you give yourself a 15 minute buffer, on top of having just a bit of extra time, if you keep your episode short the way that I do. So obviously your game, you can play it however you want, but it's all built into my calendar, the buffer time. So I know that I have time in between. It's like literally designed for me to have time for that golden window. So make time for it. Use a software or only book calls if you're doing it manually, which I wouldn't recommend. If you're doing it manually, make it so when people book spots, it's every hour or every hour and a half. So you can account for that time afterwards. But it's also kind of strategic too, because when you're on the conversation, you're getting to know someone, they're like, can you just help me with this now? When you're inviting them to that call and you're like, actually I can't because I got another call coming up. So you can book another call at a different time. That gives you space because you should have just like that one call instead of going straight into it. I like to get them excited. I usually give them a resource or a lead magnet of mine where then they're on my email list too from the conversation. And I know they're going to be a much more qualified lead too, because I'm talking to them directly and I literally am inviting them, but also it's a good resource and they get emails in between our strategy session and this interview. And then they could read through that guide. And then by the time they get on the call, they're like, I have more questions or this was really helpful for me. And all of that's supporting me showcasing value. So that's like the technical kind of piece of what if I don't have time, like make time, find a way, use the tools, set yourself up for success in terms of time. In terms of like the, I don't want to come off as weird and creepy and pushy. Again, just don't do it. There's a great saying that's actually the backdrop on my phone. And I learned this from a mentor and coach of mine who learned it from Jack Canfield, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. But it's called High Intention, Low Attachment. And I think this is really important, whether you decide to do this type of podcasting or any sort of business deal in your business and ventures, high intention, low attachment. So you have a high intention of, I want to get on a call with this because your success really comes down. If you're doing like coaching and strategy session, strategy sessions, your success comes down to how many times a month you can get people to the point where you say, here's what it looks like to work with me. Here's how much it is. Do you want to sign up? And the more times we can say that, the more chances we have of being told yes. 
like you said before, what if people say no? Like that, you got to get over that. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to get used to being told no. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful. And you're never going to have the opportunity to be told yes, because no's are just chances for you to get closer to a yes. But you have to go through them. Okay. And it goes into like high intention, low attachment. So I'm in this golden window. I have the intention of helping this person, not making a sale. And I think that that's a really important distinction. When I made that first four grand, I got to a point where I was like, I just want to help people. And that energy that I'm bringing to the table isn't needy. It's not creepy because needy is creepy. It's me showing up and trying to ask some questions to be like, are you trying to figure this out? Like online courses or something, trying to build a program? Because so many people are just like, I don't know how to do it. Or even if it's weight loss, it's like, I've been trying everything and nothing's working. But it's like, if I have a solution, I can help you. And that's really like what sales is. It's finding a problem, creating a good solution, and then offering to help people with it. Is everybody going to say yes to that? No, they're not going to. But that's why you have a high intention and a low attachment. Because if you say no... What do you mean by low attachment? Is it this, I'm going to offer because I think it can help. And if they say no, it's no big deal to me. Is that what you mean? Or is it something else? It's not a big deal. It's like if you're going on dates, like I went on so many dates when I was single before I met my girlfriend, Lexi, and I was going on tons of dates. And I just got to a point where, you know, the more that you do it too, I feel like the more used to this like low attachment you can get, because it's kind of like an art form. It was like energetics in a way, but I'm not attached. Like if a girl, I got showed up a couple of times and it's like, oh my gosh, that's the worst too. Yeah. That's the worst. Especially if you have kids and a business and other people that you could date or whatever, you like you double check, you triple check, you quadruple check, you show up on time, and it's just like a no call, no show. It's like what is even happening? Is how is there right. humans out there that like can plan something and never call, like yeah. never even say, "Hey, I'm not going to be there." Well, cool. I wouldn't have driven an hour to 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 meet you anyway. Right. Anyway, yeah. Sorry, yeah. am yeah. I going too much personal right now? No, keep no, go- keep okay. going, James. It sounds like it's hit home for you. No, uh- <laughs> That's what it is though. And it's the same thing when it comes to sales, because like, just like dating, I mean, sales is really relationships, especially when you're doing sort of coaching and that sort of stuff. You're making an agreement to work with each other longer term. It's like, we're going to kind of date in a way, you know, we're going to spend time together over a period of time. And I want to help you with this. So I think it's just really important, like high intention. I'm going to take the steps that I can and make the invites where I can. Sometimes it just doesn't feel right. And you kind of have to listen to your intuition of like, maybe it's not the best person. Like I don't need to offer to everybody, but ask questions that can set you up to where you can ask that one question. Do you want help with this? If people say, no, I think I'm good. I'm not really focusing on that right now. All good. No worries. Cool. We're going to move on. Um, it's not a big deal. And it's just having more of those conversations, but you, you, you're going to be told no in the process. Yeah. And the thing too, cause I've tried so much stuff throughout my life with like making invites and all this stuff is that if you're not getting enough sales calls, it's because you're not inviting enough people to get onto a sales call. And then on the sales call, discovery call, then um, it comes down to how many times you're inviting people to work with you. So I came up with this little like mantra that I just live by now. And it's cool because you can automate this too, but it's connect, inspire, invite. And that's all it is. And that's like the flow for each step of the way to where people end up working with you. You know, if I meet up with them and I connect with them on social media and I say, Hey, I have a podcast. This is the audience. Here's the details. Here's a link where you can listen to it. Let me know if you want to come onto it. I connected with them because I reached out. Now we're connected. We're friends on Facebook or something or met in a conversation. I started the interaction. And then they look at the podcast, they listen to some episodes and say, this sounds like a lot of fun. This seems really cool. This guy seems pretty cool. So now they're inspired. You know, they think this would be beneficial and be valuable for me and I can share it with my audience, et cetera. And then I invite them. If they say, it sounds great. I say, cool, here's where you can book a link and I'll invite them onto the podcast. And then they get onto the podcast. And then even on the podcast, we connect, they show up, we're interacting again. And then in the podcast, you inspire them by kind of, like you said, sprinkling in some nuggets of like, here's what it... Like, here's a time in my life where I did this thing where I went to Sweden for two weeks and made eight grand, you know, like that alone is inspiring that story. And people are like, Ooh, that sounds cool. Like, how'd you do that? You know, and then we could talk about it and like, Whoa, that's super cool. At the end of it, when they're inspired and they kind of have like this kind of butterflies in the stomach, just from you talking about what you're doing, then you can invite them to the strategy session, strategy session, connect, inspire, invite, but now it's to work with you. So that's just something that's really helped me. And it's just the word invite is so much better than sell. Yeah. I was about to say that. I love that. 
it feels a lot better and just a lot of cool takeaways from that. So if you're listening and like you're hearing James talk about that after call, which may have sounded scary to you at first, it's now it's like, how do we solve it for you? How did James solve it for you so that you're not going to be rushed in the wrong mindset during that call. And you mentioned a couple things. Calendly can help you. It's the length of the time plus adding a buffer. He also mentioned if you're scared to do that call to action, to go with that Jack Cantfield saying, high intention, low attachment. No's, you have to go through them. You have to go through these no's. You have to experience them and it's okay. Another couple of takeaways, James was like, I don't want people, you know, I want to just help people, not be creepy. And so a way to kind of do that, he mentioned about setting it up ahead of time by asking the right questions so that you can set it up so that they might ask. Like that one story about the eight grand while he was in, what was the place again? Sweden. Sweden. Okay. And he lives by this mantra, connect, inspire, invite. And I think this has been a great episode to help a podcaster to be able to know how am I going to monetize this thing and with tips on connecting with people and talking to them, having your right avatar on your podcast that you've been recently trying and it looks like it's working for you. It looks like you're doing it in the right way and you've shared the right way with the listeners so they can do it. Connect, inspire, invite. James, thank you for jumping on. I'm going to ask you one final question here in a second, and it's going to just be like just the best advice. What would you suggest that podcaster do next? What would you say is the next thing, the one thing that you want to leave the listener with another podcaster for their success? Yeah, I think if you have a dream of really podcasting and you see it as something that just you can't really kick because there's so many ways that you can build a business, podcasting is one of them. And no matter what, business model you choose to go with, you're going to have headaches. Like you basically get to pick the headaches that you want to have, but no matter what, you're going to have them. And there's lessons to be learned along the way and different strategies and ways that you want to approach it. But I think the best way is just to get started. If you like the strategy that I mentioned today and you feel like that could work for you, then try it. And that's really about it. You know, if you listen to Adam, he's got tons of information, different experts and stuff, like find a business model that makes sense for you and that you can roll with. And if you get results with it, practice it, double down on it. And uh, it's okay to make those pivots. But I think like the big thing is people just get too in their head when the reality is the best way to learn is by getting out there. And there's a great proverb that I heard. I can't remember where I heard this from or who it's by, but it's always stuck with me. It says the work will teach you how to do it. So it's getting out there and it's actually doing the work. And as you do the work, you start to learn, oh, this didn't really work or this did work for me. And that's like me with podcasting. I just stayed in the game, kept doing it. And there's a lot of people who have podcasts for seven years until they actually start making money or getting results from it. Using the strategy, I was able to make money a lot faster because I wasn't waiting for sponsorships or a big audience or anything like that. Uh, just a different way to leverage it. But I think that's the biggest thing. Start trying things and then finding and just don't give up on it and you'll find a way. Yeah, I agree. I think you learn a lot more by doing than and experiencing something and failing a few times at something than you do at just like reading a book and you can't get the same stuff without the experience. So really good stuff. Again, if you're listening, just remember Profit Your Knowledge. The website's in the show notes. The link to James's podcast is also in the show notes, Profit Your Knowledge. And he does course creating. He helps people to have digital products that you can make money on. And so if you are struggling with making money through your podcast, maybe making a discovery call slash sales call slash what's the other word that you called it? Strategy um, session. Strategy session. Yeah. yeah doing a well. call to kind of figure out if you guys are a good fit would be very easy. And those links are down in the show notes. Also, his bio's down there if you want to get a little bit more to know about him. And any of the social that he wanted is down in the show notes. Don't go away. I'll see you that next episode. By the way, one way to ensure that you don't miss out on great content that we're producing on a regular basis is to make sure you're subscribed to the show. You need to be subscribed or following the Apple podcast or wherever you listen to it in order not to miss all of that. And before I let you go, I need to mention because a lot of people are asking, do you help? Can you help me with this? And the answer is yes. My company actually does it. It's called Grow Your Show. And you can find that at growyourshow.com. Our clients, they call us the easy button for podcaster because they simply have to record their episode. And they know that every single thing else is done for them. We sweat the hard stuff so you can be the star of your show. 
And if you would like help to make sure that we're editing and publishing and promoting and doing your social media, it's all in one place. And I think it's pretty affordable. You'll have to take a look for yourself. Just go to growyourshow.com and check us out. And by the way, I'll see you on the next episode.